after our 18 months left. Morning. Good 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 Good morning. Good morning. Good Good morning. 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 Good Welcome to Theuda. Uh, you know the drill. We will all go around and introduce ourselves and tell you where we're from, and then you'll have two minutes if you want to make any opening remarks. Okay. We'll fire away with questions and then reserve about a minute at the end if you'd like to make any closing remarks. As you noticed, um, Volusia exposed us here doing recording the interview, so sit tall. Okay. Give them your good side. And we'll go ahead and get started. Craig? Uh, Craig Dyer, Public Defender's Office, Daytona. Pedro Brownlee, the Brownlee Law Firm. Uh, Brett Brent, who's just going in Orlando. Andy Bardos and Andre Robinson Law Firm. Good morning, Iron Vincent Citro of the Law Office of Corwitz and Citro here in Orlando. I'm David Diarmas at Kramer Price and Diarmas here in Orlando as well. Well, it's a pleasure to meet the three new members and it's great to, to see you all again. So, you want to hear Go from ahead. me? Go all right. Ahead. Well, um, I first of all, I want to. I want to Thank you for, uh, I know it was kind of a rush to get everybody together during the holidays. And I appreciate your sacrifice doing that. Um, uh, obviously, I remain interested in the appellate court and uh, submitted another application. Uh, I appreciate you inviting me in to hopefully not bore you too much. <laughs> but um, I, uh, I guess for th those of you who have heard from me before, I don't want to repeat too much of of everything. Just in brief opening, I'll, I'll say that uh, I've been a circuit judge uh, for 13 years, um, appointed by Governor Jeff Bush. I've served initially in Daytona Beach, and now I'm in the Deland Courthouse uh, in Volusia County. And uh, I've done, um, I, I have experience in all the divisions, uh, uh, civil, criminal, family law, done a little bit of everything. And uh, I, I guess probably most relevant to this proceeding is appellate work in, in our circuit unlike some circuits where they have actual appellate divisions in our circuit all the all the circuit judges are randomly assigned appeals for county court and of course I in, in a civil division we also handle um, certiorari petitions from administrative tribunals things like that um, so I see a lot of that but uh, for all 13 years I have always had some appeals going on from county court. I've heard a lot of oral arguments uh, and have issued a lot of appellate rulings, uh, affirming, reversing, so I feel like I have had a good bit of uh, experience in the appellate arena, I've written a lot of opinions. And um, so after 13 years in the circuit court, I, I began to feel the last couple of years like I was ready to tackle something different. I've always enjoyed uh, research and writing and um, so I think that would uh, be something I would enjoy in the appellate court. I feel like I could probably do a halfway decent job at it. <laughs> so, so thanks for hearing me out. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. Um, Craig Dyer again. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting you. Um, huh? And uh, most everybody I have talked to uh, have indicated that you are very good at your job. Yeah. You're reserved and, and you address things well. Um, and one of the questions that comes up when I hear that type of, of feedback, how long does it take normally for you to render an opinion on one of those appeals or on a trial issue? Well, of course, there's a, a rule I, I always think of as kind of an aspirational goal to get something out within 60 days. Um, and I, I try to do that. I, I don't like to make attorneys wait on rulings. I mean, when I practice law, um, I, I um, didn't like to have to wait forever. Um, and um, sometimes it took judges a long time. We kind of have a joke around our courthouse, and I'm not going to dare say any names, but there was one judge. I waited five years <laughs> to get a ruling. I became a judge. 
and still never got the ruling. <laughs> I'm, I'm not naming any names, but it's important to me. Um, it's always been important to me to try to accommodate the lawyers. Um, and I'm going a little beyond your question, but on I-4, everybody is running late from Orlando. The traffic's terrible. And some judges get really upset when the lawyers are running late, and I don't mind because I understand um, that kind of thing. And I don't mind delaying my schedule because we get it all done. By the end of the day, we get it all done. And so I try to be accommodating. I try to accommodate the lawyers and, and the rulings, and I don't want to make them wait. Now, I do take um, things under advisement beyond appeals. I, I do take things under advisement um, and um, to study it. And, and um, I try to get everything out within 30 days. Um, on appeals, um, I've got I've got two right now where they want an oral argument. Um, I think I could have ruled on the briefs, but they want an oral argument. So we're going to do that um, later in January, I believe. We got another one in February. Um, and um, but once I've heard that or or reviewed all the briefs if they don't want an oral argument. I, I usually I try my best to get something out within 30 days on the appeals and for sure within the 60 days because uh, I don't want to make people wait. I want to go beyond that 60 day rules. If memory serves me correctly, uh, we sent your name up last time, correct? Yes, the la I've been I've had the pleasure of being for you twice before and okay. I, I so was fortunate to be nominated both times. And I appreciate since that. May. What has changed, and how would you present yourself if your name went up again and you went from the interview process? What would you do differently? Um, I, I don't know what, the, because of the, the short um, time frame, I, I don't know if they're going to interview in Tallahassee. I haven't heard anything. Um, as far as, you know, what would I do, what have I done differently in, in my job, or what would I do differently in the interview? What, what has changed that you believe that you have your chances of getting the appointment? Well, I'm not sure, other than just um, I've continued to um, um, write opinions. In fact, you, you probably didn't have time to look. I know everything was right on my application. I added a couple more recent opinions that I was kind of proud of that had been published in the Florida sub and second. So I've added that. So just more um, writing experience. I, I'm not sure what it takes to get go that next step to get the appointment. I've tried everything I've heard. I've, I've had good interviews in Tallahassee. I felt like both times I went before, I felt like they went well. But, you know, there's a lot of competition for that sort of thing. And, um, I don't know if this, time, if this time I'll be lucky or not. I, I understand there may be another opening within the next month or so. So I may be back here. <laughs> Hopefully not, right? <laughs> <laughs> Judge, how would you, um, actually, can I back up? You said that they move for oral argument in the circuit court. Does that work? Does it function just like a normal oral argument that you would go to the fifth and argue? Mine's way more late. <laughs> <laughs> but there's three of you, of course. Or, no. Or, is that all? How many of you are sitting? It's, it's just one. It's very weird in our circuit. There's two. <laughs> two. That's very strange. Um, in, in some circuits, which well, which I prefer, although you know I don't want to trouble with some of my colleagues, I prefer the three judge panel, like they do in Orlando. Um, in our circuit, they don't want to do it that way, and this is going back years before I became a judge. They don't want to do it that way. Um, some circuits just have one circuit judge as the appellate judge from county court. In ours, they want to have two. And as I understand it, we, we're the only circuit in the state that does it this way. The theory is you've got a county judge, that's one judge, and then you've got a primary and a secondary circuit judge of appellate. So one of them, well, I guess, will agree with the county judge. If the other one disagrees, then that will be the dissent. But whichever, if one agrees with the county judge, then it's affirmed. Um, on all of those I've had so far, both of us have been in agreement on what to do with it. Um, 
it's it's a different system. There's always been a push to change it, but most of the judges like like it the way it is, and so I guess it's going to stay that way. But um, we will have a primary and a secondary judge, and really the difference is the primary judge is the one who's going to have to write the opinion. Um, but it seems to work uh, pretty well. We, we'll sit down and talk it out, and um, it's, it seems to be a pretty smooth process. If you're the one holdout, like if the, um, if, depending on which judge you are, but if you're sitting as an appellate judge in that capacity and then the other appellate judge agrees with the trial judge, um, how eager are you to write a dissent? I mean, do you think that's the sort of thing that matters in that context? Um, or would you just sort of ride with the group? Um, how eager would you be to do something like that if you think they just really screwed something up? Well, if, if I felt pretty strongly about it, I, I wouldn't hesitate to write a dissent. Um, there have been, um, I don't want to say disagreements when I've sat with another judge, but, you know, I've felt one way and another judge was not sure. And we sit down, we email each other back and forth, we sit down and discuss the issues, and um, so far we've always come around to the same way of thinking. Um, and as far as appeals I participated in, one of us has not yet had to write a dissenting opinion. Um, but if if I were the primary judge and the secondary judge wanted to do something different, if we couldn't, you know, come to terms or understanding on it, I, I wouldn't hesitate to write a, a dissenting opinion and see what happens. And they, they may want to seek further review of it. How many appeals have you got? How many of those how many? How many? Oh. Ballpark. <laughs> 25, 20, 100, oh, more 200. Um, I hold any of the numbers. I would, I would guess over 13 years, I, I would guess maybe 50. And there have been no dissents? No dissents. Is that right, Judge? Yeah, so far. Huh. <laughs> well, not <laughs> just, with, just with me. <laughs> yeah. So far. Now, what percentage do you think are getting affirmed? You know, I mean, of, no, of the ones that I do, of the, yeah, of the fifty, you know, there's no dissents. Are, are these? Are I mean, I have to think the majority of them are getting affirmed. You know, yeah. could you approximate? Um, I would guess I reversed county judges maybe in the neighborhood ten or twelve times. Yeah. So yes. I should have kept track of that. But no, it's happened. I, I keep so track of all all the. Sometimes I get affirmed. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I have it's a all about bottom file drawer. Well. <laughs> I'll let someone else have a turn. I'm sorry. I have a question about constitutional interpretation. So okay. assume that there's been a citizen initiative that was recently enacted. There was a campaign. It was adopted. It's been added to the Constitution. <coughs> and you are interpreting it now for the first time. And, and you, you lived through that campaign. And you think that perhaps that provision was that the voters intended something a little bit different from what the text suggests. How do you go about interpreting that constitutional provision and determining what it means? I, I've got to follow the, the text. I mean, that's what I'm supposed to do as a judge, I believe. Um, follow the law, and I try to, um, whether it's a statute, constitutional amendment, whatever it is, um, I try to follow the plain meaning of the text, and. Um, that's what I would do. I, I'm trying to think of any examples I might have had. I, I did, um, I, I believe I wrote about it in one of them, in the category of most significant cases. I did have a citizen's initiative. It was a local referendum, so it's not exactly what you're saying, but I did have an opportunity to write on that many years ago. But, um, but yeah, that's what I would do, just try to follow the, the text and do the best I could with it. Is there anything that you would consider other than the text? Well, I mean, I certainly would hear and consider all the arguments. Um, if there w was an argument that well, the voter intent was something different, I, you know, I would be open to everything and consider everybody's arguments. Um, but I, I think as far as what my job is, would be to, to follow the text as it's written. And um, so that, that's general, just generally speaking, that's what I would try to do. 
is there a rule of appellate procedure or a rule of civil procedure that you would change or that you think uh, you, would, you would create if you had the, had the power to do it? Anything that you think would improve the process or improve whether it's the appellate process or the trial court process? Changing a rule? Changing a rule, sure. I know what a lot of lawyers complain about. Um, I hear lawyers complaining that they would like more written opinions from appellate courts instead of PCAs. Now, I don't know if I would be so bold as to try to change any rules on that, but <laughs> I, I have, for years, I've heard that complaint that, you know, lawyers, if they want a, they want a written reason why the appellate courts rule a certain way instead of just a per curiam <coughs> affirm. And whereas, you know, if I, if I got up there, I wouldn't be making any trouble, you <laughs> say, but, but when I do my appeals, I've never done a PCA. I, I've always written an opinion. Now, sometimes it's just very brief citing case law that really answers the question, but in the appeals at the circuit level that I've done, I've, I've never done a, a procurement for an always written something because I just feel like the lawyers are entitled to know what I'm thinking and why I'm thinking that way. Um, they've gone to the trouble to write the briefs, so I'll at least explain myself and why I'm ruling the way I am instead of just procuring firm. Um, I, I don't know that I would push to change any rules on that, but if I were on the appellate board, I, I might encourage the judges on the panel to, well, let's, let's write something on this, or maybe I'll just volunteer to, to, to um, write something if they didn't want to do that. So that's, that's the only thing I could really think of that I know that some lawyers might want to see addressed. my question. <laughs> <laughs> well, even as a trial judge, I mean, do you think PCAs can ever be frustrating? Or are you just so happy to see the PCA, it doesn't matter? Oh, well, I'm and always I'm happy when I get them. <laughs> <laughs> but what, I mean, as, you know, if maybe there's like a particular issue you could have used guidance on or something, or does that not really come up very often? Not really. I mean, I've, like I said, I've got a drawer full of them. I keep all of them when I, when I get them. And especially in, in criminal, the vast majority are, are PCAs, uh, because a, a lot of those are are um, inmate post-conviction relief motions, and you have to rule on those, and it's, it's usually a PCA. Um, I do I do like to get um, you know a written opinion to give me some guidance. I, I did have one very interesting one, um, a terrible criminal case, and really really bad facts. And the fifth DCA issued a lengthy opinion affirming it. And then I was really caught by surprise, and I don't know that they've ever done this before, but the attorney for the um, de defendant or the appellant saw a rehearing alleging ineffective assistance of the defendant's attorney. On appeal? At, yeah, and um, we were all very <laughs> surprised that the appellate court decided to withdraw their opinion and issue a new opinion saying, well, they agreed that the trial attorney missed some things and it would be best to do it over. I, I was really surprised <coughs> at that, but you know, it certainly um, provided some guidance as to what to look for. I, I, I don't know as a trial judge if I could have told the attorney, well, you know, you, <laughs> you're screwing up here, you should do this or that. But it was, it was interesting, but it, it, it is helpful to me as a trial judge to to see written opinions, um, and see what the appellate board's thinking, but I'm also happy to use, just get those per year affirmed too. Yes. Do you believe that the, the list that we sent, uh, one of the requirements in order to be on that list would be prior judicial experience? Do, do I think it should? Yes. I, I think that's important. I, I've been asked that question um, in, in Tallahassee before, and to me it's important. I, you know, and I, I'm, well aware that uh, the governor has um, appointed a lot of people who have had no prior judicial experience, and, and that's fine because the governor gets to pick whomever he wants. To me, it would be important, and it would certainly help me on the appellate court to, to have the experience. Um, so, I, not not to um, not to take away from anybody who has been appointed in the past who didn't have judicial experience, but just to me, I think it is important that 
that um, you have just experience. And with 13 years under my belt, I think that will really help me a lot if I should, should make it up there. <laughs> and, and what do you think is the biggest current challenge to courts being able to maintain the integrity uh, and independence of the judiciary yeah. currently? Maintain independence? Yeah. Well, um, I, I just think um, to, I think judges should just try to uphold their oath and, and be fair and impartial and um, work hard. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking exactly, but. I, don't know. I think we're out of time. Uh -oh. Yeah. oh, sorry. As, as much <laughs> no. as we enjoy our time with yeah. you, every time you're here, we are out of time. Um, if you would like to make a few final remarks, please feel free to go ahead. Oh, j just briefly, I, it, it's, in the past, it's been a pleasure the two times before to be here. I, I tell everybody that this is such a nice, cordial group. I, I never felt like I got a grilling or anything, so <laughs> I appreciate your, your courtesy, and I really appreciate you getting together over the holidays and, and putting this together and inviting me in to, to, um, to, to talk. And it's good to see you again. It's nice, nice to meet you guys. Um, I don't really have anything else to say. It's just been a pleasure again. I hope everybody has a great new year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you. Safe travels home. All right.